Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is a very interesting one on God's mission, my mission. And lesson number nine for this series for December 2 of 2023 is entitled Mission to the Powerful. That's an interesting title. Let's see what it's going to say. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Our wonderful Father, we, we never cease to be amazed when we stop and look at the things that you did when you're here on this earth. And we will not cease to be amazed when we get to heaven and see the way in which you treat so many people who came from so many different circumstances. We will be just in awe, I'm sure. We thank you for the privilege we have of studying even these brief accounts recorded in the one book, the Bible. May we understand them and at least understand a portion of the implications is our prayer in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Who are the powerful? Would that include mainly military leaders? Or kings? Or Bank business leaders? Bankers. What kinds of people are struggling to control the world or at least a portion of it? What does the Bible say about people like that? Do gains in this world cancel the possibility of gains in the future life? Matthew 16, 26 says, Jim? Will people, excuse me, will people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. There is nothing that can give, give, give to regain their life from the American Bible Society, Good News okay. Translation. So many people among Christians are hoping that they can have a maximum amount of this world and still enjoy heaven in the future. Do you know anybody who does that? Carrie? From the Bible study guide, VSG, though written many years ago, the Bible, the Word of God, is the revelation of God's truth for our world. And among the many truths it reveals is that of human nature and that whether in 7th century Judea or 21st century Brazil, people are basically the same, sinners in need of divine grace. So we all say amen to that one. Yes. Sir. How many rich slash powerful people can you think of who are mentioned in the Bible? Let's look at the examples of just a few of them. Nebuchadnezzar. He was probably about as rich and famous as any of them, right? <laughs> yeah. Rich anyway. We cannot even imagine the life and situation in which Nebuchadnezzar lived. To rule the world and to be worshipped as a god is beyond our comprehension. But God recognized that he could reach Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel. And God is doing everything he can to save as many as possible. Dwayne, you want to read a couple of verses there for us? Sure. First Timothy 2, 4. Who wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth? It's talking about God who wants to, everyone to be saved, okay? And 1 John 2, 2. And Christ himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven, and not our sins only, but also the sins of everyone. Good News Bible. And Ephesians 1, 4. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be His through our union with Christ, so that we would be holy and without fault before Him. Wow. So every one of us sitting around this table, including every one of you out there listening, were chosen by God with your name written in the books before this world was created. Now, we have the ability to re take our names out of that, off those books, if we choose, but it was God's plan for every one of us to be saved eternally. That's incredible. Do we really believe that God would like everyone to be saved? Okay, let me ask you the real question. Would God like to save the devil? Don't sure, everyone in, talk in, at in once. His prior, yes. In his prior form, in his prior character. Okay. 
He'd love to, yeah, he'd love to take Lucifer back if it were possible. Nebuchadnezzar was the most important, most prominent king in the ancient Babylonian kingdom. He was king for longer than all of his successors combined in Babylon. And he was prone to having dreams given by God. Interesting way to reach out. Daniel 4 tells the story of how Nebuchadnezzar and his boastful pride was visited by God and warned that a terrible time was coming when he would lose his kingship. The giant tree that represented him was cut down, but a stump was left. And Daniel reminded him of what it meant and that one day he would return to his powerful position. You remember the story. One year after the dream, reality hit. Nebuchadnezzar was turned into something acting, someone, but acting like an animal. But eventually, we do not know what happened. Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses and he praised God with wonderful words. Gordon? Daniel 4, verses 34 through 37. When the seven years had passed, said the king, I looked up in the, at the sky and my sanity returned. I praised the Supreme God and gave honor and glory to the one who lives forever. Can I interrupt for a second? How many people saw the king out there acting like an animal? Hmm. Can you imagine what the teenagers would have said? What disorder is it that uh, resolves itself in seven years from insanity to sanity? Yep. Anyway, go ahead. He looks, up, he looks on the people of the earth as nothing. Angels in heaven and people on earth are under his control. No one can oppose his will or question what he does. When my sanity returned, my honor, my majesty, and the glory of my kingdom were given back to me. My officials and my noblemen welcomed me, and I was given back my royal power with even greater honor than before. And wow. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, honor, and glorify the King of Heaven. Everything he does is right and just, and he can humble anyone who acts proudly, including me. Yeah. Think about that. I mean, would you be ready to welcome somebody like that back in to be President of the United States? <laughs> You're getting too close to home. <laughs> I'm asking you, I just... Imagine God while ruling the universe, nevertheless taking time to go through several steps, dreams and all kinds of things to reach out to Nebuchadnezzar in this situation. Do you expect to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? Yes. I think so, yes. I think there's a pretty good chance. Contrast the story of Nebuchadnezzar with the story of three of the Hebrew kings, Hezekiah, Rehoboam, and Saul. Let's look at those. These are, each, each of these gentlemen were, were kings at what time. Saul was so proud and so self-centered that he could not accept guidance even from God himself. We know the terrible story of his finally going to the Witch of Endor and the next day dying in battle. We won't review that one. The other stories are not quite so familiar. Hezekiah also had his problems. Hezekiah sometimes was very close to God and sometimes not so close to God. Okay? Second Chronicles 32, 25 to 26. But Hezekiah was too proud to show gratitude for what the Lord had done for him. And Judah and Jerusalem suffered for it. Finally, however, Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem humbled themselves and so the Lord did not punish the people until after Hezekiah's death. And who was the next, next king after Hezekiah? Manasseh. Manasseh. Mm. And that was a time for, for them to be punished, for sure. Solomon's son Rehoboam allowed all sorts of pagan worship to develop during his kingship until finally the country had almost turned into a pagan nation. His father, in his younger days, was the one who had built that temple, and his grandfather had provided all the gold and everything for that temple. And now look what he's doing. So what does the Bible say about him? 
1 Kings 14, 21 to 24, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, was 41 years old when he became king of Judah. And he ruled this for 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen from all the territory of Israel as the place where he was to be worshipped. Rehoboam's mother was Nama from Ammon. The people of Judah sinned against the Lord and did more to arouse his anger against them than all their ancestors had done. They built places of worship for false gods and put up stone pillars and symbols of Asherah to worship on the hills and under shady trees. Worst of all, there were men and women who served as prostitutes at those pagan places of worship. The people of Judah practiced all the shameful things done by the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land as the Israelites advanced into the country. Hmm. So what other famous city was practicing that kind of behavior? Nineveh was one. Nineveh, but one close, a lot closer than Nineveh. Sodom. 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 This is straight out of Sodom. So Rehoboam, after, after David, then there's Solomon, and then bang, we're back to Sodom. But even Solomon uh, did some bad things. He, I think he even well, sacrificed sure. his own son, burnt him. He did, he did, actually. He built pagan temples for his wives, all his wives, on the, on the top of Mount, uh, the, uh, Mount Moriah, not Mount Moriah, uh, the Mount of Olives. Mm. And Ellen White says some of those, the ruins of some of those pagan temples were still there in Jesus' day. <laughs> Why this man on earth? But one thing though, that uh, at least four kings of Judah were really truly committed to the Lord. None of Israel. Yes. Not one. That's correct. Not one king of Israel followed the Lord. It is interesting to note that each of these powerful men had interactions with God or one of his prophets themselves, personally, we're saying. Do people in our day have those kinds of direct interactions with God? Well, I've asked a question to you and to other groups several times. How would you like to have maybe a half an hour with God at once a week? That would be great. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Except. Well, who else would demand equal time? <laughs> Can you imagine spending half an hour with the devil every week? Okay, the story of Naaman, the leper general of the Syrian army is, is fairly familiar. Christ himself talked about Naaman when he went back to preach his first sermon in Nazareth, his hometown. And that's not real, well, you know, Ellen White says that even when he was young, they asked Jesus to, to read the, teach, read the, the uh, message on Sabbath from the scrolls. And they, it, they were blessed by his, the way he read the scriptures. So that, would you, you call that as... When he what? was less than 30 as being that young? Was or way was less than 30. child? Probably, well, less than 30. Well, teenager. Uh, right. Remember, he was 12 years old and is reasoning with these big bosses and yep. they were amazed. Uh, mm -hmm. How did this kid know all of yep. this stuff? Okay. Who's next? That me? I'll take it if you want. Go ahead. I said from the writings there? Mm -hmm. From the writings of Ellen G. White, uh, EGW, few realize the full meaning of the words that Christ spoke when in the synagogue at Nazareth. He announced himself as the anointed one. He declared his mission to comfort, bless, and save the sorrowing and the sinful, and then, seeing that pride and unbelief controlled the hearts of his hearers, he reminded them that in time past, God had turned away from his chosen people because of their unbelief and rebellion, and had manifested himself to those in heathen lands who had not rejected the light of heaven. The widow of Sarepta and Naaman the Syrian had lived up to all the light they had, hence they were accounted more righteous than God's chosen people who had backslidden from him and had sacrificed prison let me do that again, had sacrificed principle to convenience and worldly honor. That's an 
Wow. The white Acts of the Apostles. It's, wow. It's amazing. Naaman was a powerful general in charge of the Syrian army. And yet, when he heard of the possibility that someone in Israel could heal him of his disease, he was willing to listen to a slave maiden for directions. He traveled to Israel with an enormous offering to pay for his healing, but Elisha would not accept it. Elisha asked him simply to go and wash himself in the Jordan River, dipping seven times. 2 Kings 5, 17 to 19, we notice two very interesting conclusions to the whole story. One, in ancient times, it was believed that gods were assigned to different territories in the world. <clears throat> in order to worship a certain god, one had to be in his or her territory. So Naaman asked if it was possible for him to carry two mule loads of soil from Israel back to Syria so he could worship God on God's own ground. How do you think God felt about that? <clears throat> well, he says, you, if you really want to do it, that's okay. I, I think God honored him. Yes. Mm -hmm. He said, it's, he's doing what he thinks is right. Right. Clearly, Naaman was convinced that the God of Israel, Yahweh, was far superior to any of the other gods he knew about. So he chose to worship the true God, even in his own country. But Naaman, being the general of the army, followed the king, he was expected to follow the king and protect the king around, follow him around pretty much all the time on all of his activities. So he requested that God would forgive him if he had attended the king of Syria when the king went to worship the god Rimmon. He did not want Yahweh to think that he was worshiping any other god. And Elisha had told him to, no, don't do that. Don't go anywhere near the temple of Rimmon. Is that what he said? Oh, go in peace. Go in peace. Okay. Jim? These words must not be thought of as expressing approval or disapproval of Naaman's parting request. He was to depart in peace, not in doubt or restless uncertainty. God had been kind to him, and he was to find happiness and peace in his knowledge and worship of God. Naaman was a new convert, a man with conscience, conscientious, conscientious. scruples, who, excuse me, who would grow in strength and wisdom if he clung to his newfound faith. God leads new converts on step to call step, excuse me, converts on step by step and knows the appropriate moment in which he calls for a reform in a certain matter. This principle ought to always be borne in mind by those who labor for the salvation of souls from the Bible Commentary, Volume 2, 878. Okay, so where do you think Naaman turned for his instructions about how to worship Yahweh? A foreign servant. A foreign f woman? Female servant. Female servant? Female oh dear. servant child. Carrie? Sorry, I'm on some way of listening over here. Uh, to whom would Naaman turn for learning about the true God to his servant maiden? What lessons should we learn from this story about not pushing people too quickly, especially those who come from a non-Christian background? Yeah. That's from that old Sabbath school study guide. Think of the impact that that young slave maiden who worked for Naaman's wife has had on the world. Yeah. Dwayne? Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Yeah. That's the question there. So God delivered Syria from the Assyrians, was it? Yes. Does God work for heathen people? He did. Now, some people would say he did that to keep them away from the Israelites, but I think, I think he worked for the Syrians, too. The Assyrians even further away? Yeah. Uh, the, the Assyrians, just a sad question, I think they were the first world um, power. power. Then Egypt. Egypt was probably before that. Egypt and then Assyria. Nineveh or Assyria. All right. 
and then, and then course, Babylon, Babylon right. Medo-Persian, uh, Medo Medo Greece, Greece, and Rome. And Rome right. yeah, these are the world powers. So Egypt and then mm -hmm. Assyria. Okay, Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, had defeated the armies of Israel in the battle which resulted in the death of Ahab. Since that time, the Syrians had maintained against Israel a constant border warfare, and in one of their raids, they had carried away a little maid who, in the land of her captivity, waited on Naaman's wife. A slave far from her home, this little maid was nevertheless one of God's witnesses, mm. unconsciously fulfilling the purpose for which God had chosen Israel as his people. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Do you think when we get to heaven, God will call her up and say, see this young lady? Remember what she did? This salvation story we're going to talk about throughout eternity, and I bet that she's going to come up. Mary Magdalene is going to take a lot of time, I know. Yep. It's going to be beautiful. Okay, I'm sure God is going to honor her before the entire universe. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, let's see. As she ministered in that heathen home, her sympathies were aroused in behalf of her master. And remembering the wonderful miracles of healing wrought through Elisha, she said to her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Sam Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now let's think about that for a second. What we just we said a little while ago, how many of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel were righteous, were, were God-following kings? Not one. Zero. Not one. So we have a, a, a pagan, basically pagan Israelite king, and here's the, this person from Syria is coming down to get advice and help from Yahweh, and he's sent to this pagan king. I mean, I, he was an Israelite, but he was basically acting like a pagan. Okay, go ahead. Uh, let's see. She knew that the power of heaven was with Elisha, and she believed that by his, this power, Naaman could be healed. The conduct of the captive maid, the way that she bore herself in that heathen home, is a strong witness to the power of early home training. There is no higher trust than that committed to fathers and mothers in the care and training of their children. Parents have to do with the very foundations of habit and character. By their example and teaching, the future of their children is largely decided. Wow. Scary. Unless the government can do it first. <laughs> Happy are the parents whose lives are a true reflection of the divine so that the promises and commands of God awaken in the child gratitude and reverence. The parents whose tenderness and justice and long-suffering interpret to the child the love and justice and long-suffering long of God, and who by teaching the child to love and trust and obey them, <coughs> are teaching him to love and trust and obey his Father in heaven. Parents who impart to the child such a gift have endowed him with a treasure more precious than the wealth of all the ages, a treasure as enduring as eternity. We know not in what line our children may be called to serve. They may spend their lives within the circle of the home. They may engage in life's common vocations or go as teachers of the gospel to heathen lands. But all are alike called to be missionaries for God, ministers of mercy to the world, they are to obtain an education that will help them to stand by the side of Christ in unselfish service. Amen. Wow. Helen White, Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm sorry, Prophets and Kings, 244 to 245. It is interesting to notice Elisha's exchange with Naaman. He did not try to give Naaman a lot of information about the worship of the true God. We don't have any anything. We don't have any evidence that he tried to say anything about God. He just said, "Go in peace." Where did Naaman get his later information about the truth? Was it from the young maiden? 
In the New Testament, one of the outstanding wealthy individuals was Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a member of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. He was recognized by his community as being faithful to God, keeping all the... So who were his, his community, his, his, his local group in, back in those days? The Pharisees, the, the leaders. Yeah, the, the spiritual leaders, the so-called spiritual leaders of the nation. Right. So he was right there up there with Congress kind of thing, mm -hmm. okay? He was recognized as being faithful to God, keeping all the commandments. Remember the rich young ruler? Kept him from a youth up. He was a respected leader among the Jews. He was powerful and wealthy. So it was assumed by the Jews that he was a good man because God was blessing him, right? What's the word? If you're good, God will bless you, right? Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and most of the Pharisees were constantly at odds with Jesus. Do you think that it is possible that Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees that had been delegated to try to trap Jesus at one time or another? It's possible. It's possible yeah. How did he find out about Jesus? Maybe he volunteered because he wanted to know more about Jesus. Hmm. You learned about Jesus by observing what Jesus did. But if you're a Pharisee and you're observing Jesus, what are you doing? Different paradigm. <laughs> How can I trap him? Yeah. There were a lot of Pharisees who later realized that they had been on the wrong side and chose to become faithful believers, even church leaders. Max 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger. Mm -hmm and a great number of priests mm. accepted the faith. And priests a great, are Sadducees. A great number of what? Priests. Sadducees? What about the next verse? Acts 15, 5, but some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees what? stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. Good news, Bible. They hadn't given up their old way, all of their old ways, but so in that early church there were what kind of people? Mixed multitude. <laughs> okay, mixed multitude. Okay, Sadducees and Pharisees. Rich and educated. Rich and educated. So the story of Nicodemus's first visit with Jesus is recorded in John 3, 1 through 21, is very familiar. John 3, 16, in the middle of that story, is perhaps the best known Bible verse of all time. Remember that Nicodemus had probably memorized, in order to reach to that kind of position in the, in the nation, he had probably memorized much of the Old Testament in Hebrew, and he knew all the rules and teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, he was a Pharisee, but I'm sure he knew all the detailed rules for the Sadducees as well, because he dealt with them every day. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, right? Mm -hmm. But he still felt a spiritual need. I mean, this is a guy who was supposed to be one of the top saints, right? And he also asked the right question. What mm -hmm. must I do to be saved? He was honest enough to recognize that Jesus was at least a great teacher and possibly the Messiah. Nicodemus came to Jesus with his usual facade as one of the leaders of Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know who I am? But Jesus paid no attention to the facade. He responded to Nicodemus by pointing out to him that he still needed to understand what true religion is all about. John chapter 7, verse 43 to 52. So there was a division in the crowd because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid hand on him. When the guards went back, the chief priests and the Pharisees asked them, why did you not bring him? Remember, they had sent these, <clears throat> these temple guards out there to arrest Jesus. The guards answered, nobody has ever talked like this man. Did he fool you too? The Pharisees asked them, have you ever known one of the authorities or the Pharisees to believe in him? This crowd does not know the law of Moses. So they are under God's grip, God's curse. One of the Pharisees there was Nicodemus, 
a man who had gone to see Jesus before, he said to others, According to our law, we cannot condemn anyone before hearing him and finding out what he has done. Well, they answered, are you also from Galilee? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Study the scriptures and you will hear that no prophet ever comes from Galilee. That's not true. Which prophet came from Galilee? Well, there's two that, yeah. two that work there that obviously we know about. Isaiah, well, no, Amos and Hosea. Amos and Hosea worked there. Amos came from the south, but he was, Hosea was from there. That was his home. Not only that, Jesus' hometown was, what was the name of Jesus' hometown during most of his ministry? Nazareth. What? Nazareth. No, not his home. Well, I mean the place where he lived during his ministry. Oh. Capernaum. Was Capernaum. It. You know what Capernaum, what that name means? Capernaum, the village of Nahum. Mm. That was probably the hometown of the prophet Nahum. Another one from Galilee. Okay. Nicodemus did not let it be known that he was a follower of Jesus. But on several occasions, he raised questions that prevented the Pharisees from taking action against Jesus. And I'm sure they were answering him with sarcasm. Finally, when Jesus died, Nicodemus went to the aid of the disciples and did for Jesus what they could not have done. John 19, 39. Nicodemus, who at first had gone to see Jesus at night, went with Joseph, is another one we need to talk about, taking with him about 30 kilograms of spices. How much, what would 30 kilograms of spices cost? Mm -hmm. Not free. Mm. A, multi, a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Remember Mary's gift? Cost, well, they, they claimed it would have cost, what, 200 or 300 silver coins? Ellen White comments, Jim. After the Lord's ascension, Sorry. when the disciples were scattered by persecution, Nicodemus came boldly to the front. He employed his wealth in sustaining the infant church that Jews had expected to be blotted out at the death of Christ. In the time of peril, he who had been so cautious and questioning was firm as a rock, encouraging the faith of the disciples and furnishing means to carry forward the work of the gospel. <coughs> he was scorned and persecuted by those who had paid him reverence in other days. He became poor in his worldly goods, his world's goods, yet he faltered not in the faith which had its beginning in the night conference with Jesus. Why do you think Nicodemus decided to go and see Jesus secretly? Nicodemus really, it's going to be related to John, the story of that interview, and by his pen, it was recorded for the instruction of millions. The truths, the truths were taught, they're taught, are as important today as they were on that solemn night in the shadowy mountain when the Jewish ruler came to learn the way of life from the lowly teacher of Galilee. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 177. I want to see that whole experience in 3D living color when we get to heaven. We're going to have, all this is going to be spread out. I want to watch Nicodemus as he leaves home he dressed probably in a very plain garment. I'm sure he wasn't wearing his fancy garb. I doubt it anyway. And what did he have to, did he have to ask somebody to figure out where Jesus was? Or did he have someone investigate that for him? I want to see this whole thing unfold. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, of course. Another well-known story in the Bible paints a very different picture. Matthew 19, 16 to 22, Carrie. Once a man came to Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what good thing must I do to receive eternal life? Now that's a good question, right? Yeah. Why what do you must I do? Well, okay. What must I believe? Uh, Go ahead. Why do you ask me concerning what is good? Answered Jesus. There is only one who is good. 
Keep the commandments if you want to enter life. What commandments, he asked. Jesus answered, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not accuse anyone falsely, respect your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. I have obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else do I need to do? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven, then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he was very rich. Kind of now, rocked his boat, didn't it? What a contrast to the story of Nicodemus. Yeah. Which of these two stories most clearly represents a typical human response? Last Why do you suppose this young man rejected Jesus? Remember that in Jesus' day, it was believed that if, you're rich and, if you were rich and powerful, you were obviously a good person because God was blessing you. So when Jesus said, sell all your goods and give to the poor, he was asking him to give up all the evidence that he had that he was a good man and to live as if he were a sinner, rejected isn't it, isn't by God. The, the point of view for millennia, all recorded history, that's the po point of view. If you're well off financially yeah. and your health is good, sm God's smiling on you. Yeah. And the flip side is, is, is uh, <laughs> you've offended the deity. Yeah, no, I mean, that's nothing new. That's just the way life is in, 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 <laughs> in all philosophies. Yeah. Churches peddle it all that day in and day out. Instant wealth, instant health, and fire insurance. What is it that is so difficult for the rich and powerful? Why is it that it's so difficult for the rich and powerful to be saved? Gary, is this yours? Oh, I was just mulling over the question. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 19. 19, 23 to 24. Jesus then said to his disciples, I assure you, it will be very hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. I repeat, it is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's I mean, that's about as upside down and backwards in the, <laughs> in the disciples' thinking as you possibly could get, right? Uh, in the end, the rich and the poor face the same fate, the grave. This means that the rich are in as desperate need of salvation as is anyone else. Whatever else money can buy, it cannot buy an exemption from death. That exemption comes only as a gift offered freely by Jesus to whoever will claim it by faith. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. It's from John 11:25, New King James Version. Yeah. An another rich man that Jesus had some direct contact with was Zacchaeus. Yeah. Dwayne? Uh, Luke 9, 1 through 10. 19. He, uh, 19, thank you. 1 through 10. Jesus went on into Jericho and was passing through. There was a chief tax collector there named Zacchaeus, who was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was a little man and could not see Jesus because of the crowd. So he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus, who was going to pass by that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, Hurry down, Zacchaeus, because I must stay in your house today. Wow. I mean, just, just think of the response of Zacchaeus one, on one side and the, the, the response of the cloud, uh, crowd on the other side. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Zacchaeus hurried down and welcomed him with great joy. All the people who saw it started grumbling. This man has gone as a guest to the house of a sinner. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Listen, sir, I will give half my belongings to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times as much. Did Jesus ask him to do that? It's not no recorded. evidence. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, Salvation has come to this house today. For this man also is a descendant of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek 
and to save the lost. What a contrast to the response of the rich young ruler. What, what do you suppose Zacchaeus knew about Jesus? Why did he respond in the way he did? Jesus did not ask him to give up anything, but Zacchaeus was willing to give up a major portion of his riches. And there were others among the rich who are attracted to Jesus. Think of the story of Joseph of Arimathea. We know nothing about him except what he did after Jesus was dead, although he may have joined Nicodemus in defending Jesus before the Sanhedrin. His brief story is mentioned in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. And so let's just re review his, his story very, very quickly. What do we know about Joseph of Arimathea? Matthew 16, 26. Ooh. Hold on, just before you go there, what do we know about Joseph of Arimathea? He's the one who took the body down of Jesus and buried Okay, him. who actually was involved in taking the body down? John. John and Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Three of them took the body down. Okay. And where did they take the body? To his tomb. All you Bible scholars? To the... To the uh... He was taken and buried in the tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Right. Okay. There's also a tradition that he was ended up in Glastonbury in, in England. Uh, <laughs> Joseph Arimathea. Oh, Joseph. Oh, that could be. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Okay, so go ahead, Gordon. Matthew 16, 26. Will people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. There's nothing they can give to regain their life from the Good News Bible. Okay. In the Bible study guide, Jesus knew how to make friends with the powerful. He was admired and respected by many of these people, and at the same time, he was also despised by many. The powerful people in the Bible who came to Jesus for help surely sensed that he cared for them. Also, many of the rich and powerful did not openly come to Jesus right away. They waited until they were certain that Jesus was truly the Son of God. How did they figure that out? Yeah. Such was the case both with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea in the Bible study guide. Okay, now, why do you think rich and powerful men like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, Zacchaeus, Matthew, and others were attracted to Jesus? Apparently, Joseph, like Nicodemus, had been a secret admirer and follower of Jesus would basically know nothing else about him except the fact that he offered to allow Jesus to be buried in his family tomb and help Nicodemus and the disciple John to take the body of Jesus down from the cross and bury it. Would you dare to ask your family to bury you in the tomb where Jesus had slept, had, had, had been buried? So how should we approach rich people? Remember back, if you remember back to the story of Elisha, what happened to the person who was thrown into his, his burial cave? Raised. Yeah. Raised came, to came back to life. Back to life. Yeah. Yes, came back to life. So how should we approach rich people? Charles, I think that's yours. Where to begin can be one of the most difficult phases in making friends with powerful people. In general, it's better not to pursue them. Let them come to you. Mm. So if you can figure out some way, and that's one of the reasons why medicine is such a wonderful opportunity. People come to you. You don't have to ask them to come. They come. Okay, go ahead. Well, um, what's happening in this world today for a serious Seventh Adventist is a golden opportunity to reach out to people all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's face it, diabetes is uh, is spreading all over the world at a an alarming way. 4.7 percent increase annual all over the world. If it keeps going like that, it's going to take about 20 years, and every person in the world. Yes, going to be a diabetic. But you see, 
it's a golden opportunity for us. Uh, I cannot talk, uh, but uh, a Muslim country, on the only Hindu country anywhere in the world. Uh, and yeah. it's, it's time for us as a church to wake up. Um, yeah. Whatever church leaders, if they will listen to. But uh, things are, have to change. We, we, we have a golden, beautiful message and it needs to be taken to the world now. The opportunity is there. Yep. Since India and China are just... Yeah, the, India is the capital of diabetes. Yeah. Well, China is not too far behind. Yeah, China is not too far behind. It seems to me that leprosy is very much around. You get in that, some places. You see it in the newspapers. I get stuff in the mail sometimes about it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably... Uh, they want money to it help. It's an ugly head up in a few yeah. places, but... I, I, obesity is spreading like crazy all over the world. It's unbelievable what's happening. But I look at it as a golden opportunity for mm -hmm. us. And uh, if the church leaders are listening, I mean, we need to change our uh, our approach. Well, what what about uh, Matthew 19? What was it? 18 and 19. It says, uh, "Don't don't." It said murder, but you could just say, "Don't kill, don't steal, don't do adultery, and don't bear false witness." How about telling the truth about the Creator? Yeah. We have to find a way. We have to earn our rights to be heard. Yeah, that's true also. Yeah, and, and but, then, of course, till the... And Jesus it came to... to what, the Bible tells us in Matthew, uh, excuse me, in John 18, 37, when Jesus is talking to Pilate, his purpose, as the reason he was born, is to bear witness to the truth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He did, there's no text that supports the position, uh, if it's properly translated, that K Jesus came to die to pay a penalty for sins. Yeah. That's a pagan concept yeah, that's true. been yeah. for all religions have had that. Right. The, all religions have had a d God that will punish and destroy, but you come along with, with one of these deities that will pay the p a p a penalty so that the p a individual does not have to suffer post-mortem uh, mm -hmm. punishment or uh, uh, what's the term uh, pur 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 purgatory yeah and then they have oh, multiple, and they have multiple to, deities everybody who goes to purgatory ends up in heaven <laughs> you still got it's a punishment it's still post-mortem <laughs> yeah. punishment it, it yeah. came to vindicate the character of God yeah but how do you do that it, 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 it's just truth yeah. bear witness to the truth okay we need to move on we don't have much time left Jesus did this. They became a witness to his message, healing and power from God. They were convinced beyond the scenes that he is truly the Son of God. Powerful people will seek to partner with genuine ministry for a number of reasons. They want to be a part of something good that is changing the lives of people. This is one way they knew that it can also change their lives. It provides a substitute way for the rich and powerful to get the help they need without publicly disclosing their needs. The second phase is to begin a genuine ministry as an avenue for the church and powerful to be, uh, for the rich and powerful, I'm sorry, to be part of God's ministry. Take some time to invest in the lives of the rich and powerful in your society from our Bible study guide for Thursday. Well, what could we do to try to reach out to some wealthier, powerful people in our society and in our day? Jim? The challenge is, add someone to your daily prayer list who is a, in a position of power, not a believer, and is someone you could come in contact with from time to time. Challenge up, address a letter or email to someone in a position of power, even if it is someone you may never have met, and tell that person that you are praying for him or her. Okay. It's pretty tough to get emails to people. That, yeah. that, that's almost an impossibility. Well, it seems obvious. Sometimes we overlook the fact that Jesus loves everyone. The same. Rich or poor, powerful or hopeless, princes as well as paupers. Every one of us needs salvation that only God can offer. So why did Jesus say it is so difficult for a rich person to be saved? Because it's a healing process that takes time. It's not a magical 
abracadabra wave yeah. of a wave of a wand or something like that. Uh, okay, Carrie, Mark tw ten twenty five. Okay, it is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's from the so we read day. earlier the same passage from Matthew, and here it is from Mark. Okay, Duane, you want to take the next Ellen right there? Much is said concerning our duty to the neglected poor. Should not some attention be given to the neglected rich? Many look upon this class as hopeless, and they do little to open the eyes of those who, blinded and dazed by the glitter of earthly glory, have lost eternity out of their reckoning. Thousands of wealthy men have gone to their graves unwarned. But indifferent as they may appear, many among the rich are soul burdened. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. He that says to fine gold, Thou art my confidence, <coughs> has denied the God that is above. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth, ceaseth forever. Ecclesiastes 5.10. And so forth in Ministry of Healing. Yeah. How, do, how do we as Adventists try to reach across the gap, even in our society, between the rich and the poor? What are we doing? What did Jesus mean when he talked about the deceitfulness of riches? Well, back in... Uh, John Harvey Kellogg's day, that hospital in Battle Creek, the most famous people from the world were coming there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think President Taft went there. Yeah, like, something like that. I think so. Right. Mayo. I mean, big, big people, big names were there. Okay. What did Jesus mean when he talked about the deceitfulness of riches? Are only the rich deceived by the deceitfulness of riches? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, Gordon. Oh, I'm sorry. Jesus recognized that it wouldn't be easy for naturally selfish human beings to become his faithful followers and receive a reward in heaven. So Matthew 16, 24, 28 suggests that we must, in fact, take up the cross if we want to follow Jesus. Now, I, you know, that one, that verse just completely bamboozles me. Matthew, what happens in Matthew 16? Do you remember what the, what the context is here? Jesus is working with his disciples. He takes them outside of Judean and Galilean territory completely. He's, he's in the pagan territory. He travels up to Caesarea Philippi, there where there's pagan temples around. And that's where Jesus asks them, who do men say that I am? And so they answer several things. And finally, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, and so forth, which is wonderful. And what happens next? I think next is get the Jesus body. said, anyone who wants to follow me must take up his cross and follow me. At that point in time, what in the world did they think when Jesus said, take up their cross? That, that was way before, well, not way before, but quite a while, quite a ways before hit the crucifixion. I mean, the cross was the worst possible punishment you could get from the Roman government. No, they, they refused to understand. They refused to. Uh, wow. Okay. Thought about that. Gordon, Luke 14. Verse 25. Once when large crowds of people were going along with Jesus, he turned and said to them, those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters and themselves as well. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. So there we have it. That's one of the places where it says that. If one of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and work out what it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation, and all who see what happened will laugh at you. This man began to build, but can't finish the job, they will say. 
that we, we see when we go by a house or a church or something that's not finished? Half finished. Verse 31, if a king goes out with 10,000 men to fight another king who comes against him with 20,000 men, he will sit down first and decide if he is strong enough to face that other king. If he isn't, he will send messengers to meet the other king to ask for terms of peace while he is still a long way off. In the same way, concluded Jesus, none of you can be my disciples unless you give up everything you have. Good News Bible. Wow. Paul recognized the challenge that Jesus was addressing when he wrote 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. Charles? For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. Jesus wants all there is of us. We cannot place our personal priorities over him or we will lose salvation. We are expected to die daily to self-interest, selfish desires, and any ambitions that would harden our relationship with him, hinder our relationship with him, I'm sorry. If you had to choose right now to die and be saved or to live on and be lost, what would you say and what would you choose? I'm putting that question to you out there. Jesus also demands, we're running out of time here, Jesus also demands of his followers a devotion that surpasses their instinct to preserve their own lives. Disciples must prioritize their devotion to Jesus over life itself as a symbol of an unavoidable and most excruciating death. Taking one's cross to follow Jesus epitomizes a commitment to the highest possible cost of being his disciples. Just as carrying a literal cross was an act of submitting to the Romans, taking one's cross to follow Jesus refers to Jesus' call for his disciples, total submission to him. Let us never forget that every person who exists on our world is a child of God. He would like to save every one of them. In the Bible, we know of many people who were wealthy, Abraham, Isaac, Job, David, and the Old Testament, Matthew, Barnabas, Paul, and Ethiopian eunuch, and Cornelius, the Roman centurion in the New Testament. There are many, of course, there were, of course, many others. Think of the story of Paul, who went from being a member of the Sanhedrin, a wealthy and well-liked young man, to being the apostle to the Gentiles. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of learning more of these things that are a challenge, of tremendous challenge to us. Help us to know how to witness to people at every level is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.